if I can make a cast a little bit better than, than the, the, the last few guys, I might have a fish, I might have a, a chance here. So I'll make a short cast first, right in close. My stimulator. Not a great present. Oh, there he is. There he is. Got a fish on. Did you hear that one? Woo! Fish on, baby. That was very cool. On the, ooh, oh, he's running. He's running. He's running. There he goes. There he goes. Oh, that's beauty. Beauty. Taking me downstream. I'm going to follow this little red side. He's the first cast. Oh, look at him go. Hey, that was me with a nice Deschutes River red side during the salmon fly hatch. This is going to be a special episode to celebrate all of you, to celebrate where the show has come from, and to launch season two. This is season two of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. That little guitar intro came from my good friend Russ, who you'll hear from more as we get into this episode. I am kicking off Season 2 of this special episode that covers one of the great hatches of the West, Terranarsis californica, or the giant salmon fly hatch. I have a very special guest as well, John Smaralio, on to tell us about the hatch and how to fish it, some tips. Plus, I share a few additional tips from our trip and our uh, time on the river. Stay till the end in this one as there was this intense event during our trip that involved a 14-foot raft that capsized in one of the worst rapids on the river. I was there step-by-step step to help get these guys to safety, and I'll share a little bit of that story as well. So, without further ado, here's John Smaralio from the Deschutes Canyon Fly Shop. How's it going, John? Pretty good. How you doing? Good. Good to have you on here, Uh I got some uh, some good questions here to chat uh, chat with you about. Uh, I wanted to focus uh, quite a bit here on the salmon fly hatch since that's a, a topic uh, that's probably hot on your mind right now on the on the Deschutes. Um, but before I get started, I, I like to kind of hear a little bit of background on on how you got into fly fishing and how you got to where you are now with the fly shop, which has been around for for quite some time. Maybe you can give us a little rundown on how it all came to be. Sure. Um, I'm originally from Portland, born and raised, and uh, been camping and fishing all my life with my my family, my friends, and and so forth. And uh, I was uh, started fishing when I was about five or six years old. And uh, the first place I fished was here on the Deschutes River, and I uh, caught my first trout at that time. Um, and then at around age ten, um, I was introduced to fly fishing uh, through another friend. Um, and, uh, it was just, I thought it was so, so neat. Uh, but at that time I didn't have a lot of resources. So, um, saved my, you know, summertime allowance and, and went to a, a local fly shop in Portland and bought the components to build a, a little, uh, fly rod in the basement of my house and, um, got, learned how to cast it and, and, uh, thought it'd be fun to build another one. And so I did. And, before I knew it, by the time I was in my teens, I had a small uh, custom rod building business mm. and uh, started started to uh, tie flies um, and um, started uh, filling orders in some of the local fly shops when, when they needed flies. And of course, all the while, uh, fishing the shoots and, and learning about the shoot the shoots all along and um, jumping jumping way ahead. Um, in 1985, I moved to Maupin from Portland and um, set up a, a small shop uh, next to the Oasis Cafe mm -hmm. and uh, was building the rod for the inventory and tying the flies for the inventory and hand tying tapered leaders and just literally starting from, from scratch. Uh, and, you know, thankfully the business kept growing and uh, I started taking on some more commercial lines and uh, started guiding and... Um, you know, uh, it was, um, you know, I felt very, feel very fortunate that I've been able to, to make a, a, a comfortable, um, uh, living somewhat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's more of a lifestyle as yep. opposed to living right. at fly fishing and, and here on the Deschutes. Uh, uh, so I feel very blessed, uh, and fortunate. Um, and here I am, uh, 33 years later. Wow. Um, still, still going at it. That's yeah. That's great. That's so, great. So when you, when you started in, uh, in Moppin in 85, were you the only fly shop? 
Uh huh. Yep. yep. I was, I was, well, I, the little building I leased was from uh, the McGlucas family and, oh, yeah. and Mike McGlucas. He, he had a few tackle items in his cafe there, but it was just really kind of, it became sort of a nuisance and he thought that it would be better if he could separate the tackle from the cafe. And, and so it was, that was a perfect transition. And so it was hmm. still next to the cafe, you know, a few yep. steps. And, um, but yeah, I was, I was the only pro shop in Maupin at that time. That's awesome. That's great. Cool. We'll, we'll dig into more of uh, a little bit more on uh, your business a little bit later as uh, time allows, mm-hmm. but I did want to talk about the, Salmon flies, and you mentioned that you guide, and uh, you know, right now we're in, uh, I guess, May, getting uh, mid to late May. I mean, maybe you can describe how, when you take a client out on the Deschutes during the salmon fly hatch, how you know you get them into fish, and how that whole process works. Because I think, you know, there's a lot of big bugs coming off, and there's a lot of things going on. And I don't know if it would be better for you to, if you could explain a little bit about the life um, cycle of uh, the sand flies, if that would help, or, or if you just want to dig into some tips and stuff like that. Well, uh, <clears throat> actually, uh, let's talk about the life cycle of, of that, uh, the stone fly. Um, and I'll keep it as brief as possible. Mm-hmm. Typically stone flies will live, you know, as a nymph in the river for uh, four to five years before they emerge as, as out of the river and, and become the, the winged adult. So, uh, you know, it takes a long time for them to, to reach maturity, um, much more so than any other insect. And uh, they are very large. They're the largest. Um, so they crawl out of the river and they get on the trees and the, and the rocks and so forth. And then they break out and into out of their nymphal shock. And then they, they um, become the winged adult and, and uh, dry out more or less. And, and, uh, start flying around and, and, you know, over a couple of days, they'll, they'll mate up and, and, uh, then the females in the, in the day or so give them the right air conditions and, and weather, weather conditions will fly out over the river in the afternoons and, and oh, deposit their eggs. And of course, obviously, um, you know, these trout, these red band trout, typically, uh, their spawning cycle is, is, uh, anywhere from late March through April into the first part of May. Uh, and sometimes will extend into, you know, the first part of June. And so as they come off their spawn cycle, um, their energy and their, their fats and proteins are pretty, pretty depleted. So it seems like mother nature kind of takes care of these fish by offering them such a big abundant uh, meal source or, or food source. And so obviously these fish, you know, regain their strength and uh, so forth with uh, with the salmon flies and, and, and the other hatches that take place. But the salmon flies and golden stones and even the little, little yellow mm-hmm. sallies will hatch typically um, this time of year. And so the, the hatch cycle starts sometimes late April, but usually we see the winged adults, you know, starting to fly around typically or between the 5th and the 10th of May. And then right around sort of the middle of May, you know, the 15th or so, and this is very general, um, you know, the, the hatch is pretty much, you know, amping up, ramping up. And, uh, and, and then usually the last two weeks of May, it's in its peak activity level. And then uh, it starts to tail off a little bit the first part of June. And by the middle of June, it's pretty much over. So on this river, because, you know, the lower to shoots is a hundred miles long, this hatch lasts anywhere from typically anywhere from four to six weeks. Mm-hmm. So that's a long time. Um, mm-hmm. a lot of other Western rivers, uh, you only have a couple of days to catch the salmon fly golden stone oh, hatch. Wow. And that's pretty much it, you know? So this one, I think the reason it's so famous is because mm-hmm. of its longevity. And that's why <clears throat> it's, you know, it gives the, gives the fly angler, anglers uh, uh, an opportunity to fish uh, a nice big bug uh, in, in a beautiful time of the year for these mm-hmm. big, big food trout. So that's, and that's a very general uh, sort of explanation of, of yep, the life cycle. That's of perfect. The fly. Um, and so, you know, obviously people want to take advantage of that. And the deschutes can be a little intimidating to the initial uh, angler that is used to fishing smaller classic trout streams. This one's, you know, one of the top 10 large Western rivers. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, when people show up, they say, Hmm, how do I tackle this beast? So, uh, 
that's when I come in and, and help them, you know, deal with that. And really the best thing that I tell most of what I tell people is pretend that the shoots is you know, 30 feet wide. <laughs> it's really, you know, most of your fish you, you're, you're, you're doing is going to be right up against the bank and, you know, it's it's rare, it's not impossible, but it's very rare to catch fish out toward the middle of the river where the heavier currents are. So um, it behooves anglers to concentrate their efforts from shoreline out to around 30 feet. You know, some areas are smaller, some areas are wider, but that's pretty much the shoots, fish mm-hmm. it like a small river. Um, and, you know, trout are obviously structure-oriented. They're trying to stay away from predators and feel safe and, and get a food source at the same time. So areas that have tree lines, um, banks that have a lot of rocks and structure that, you know, melt into the river, of course, in those areas that provides protection from predators and, and, and provides a good source of, of uh, seam lines and foam lines for these bugs get trapped into and, and fish can feed on them pretty freely. So um, typically when I take a climb on the river, I try to talk about um, the approach, you know, and how to read the water, what to look for. You know, understand the basic, uh, you know, behavior of the insect, knowing that, you know, these bugs are against, you know, they crawl out, so they don't swim to the surface like mayflies or caddis. So they crawl out, so they're near the bottom. They're up against the bank. They're very close to the shoreline. So the trout naturally move in with them to, you know, take advantage of that uh, that hatch cycle. And then, of course, as the adults are on the banks and along the grasses and the roots of trees and so forth, um, they pretty much hang in that area. And, you know, as, as you know, or may not know on the Deschutes here, it gets pretty windy from time to time. Mm-hmm. And if you get a nice warm sunny afternoon in May, air temperatures can be anywhere from 65 to 85 degrees. Typically they're anywhere from 70 to 75 degrees. And, um, the bugs start to move around a little bit and a gust of wind comes up and, you know, knocks them into the river and, you know, there you have it, um, an easy mm-hmm. meal. And, uh, hmm. you know, Mother Nature offers a, that sort of scenario up quite a bit. Yeah. So I teach people to, you know, fish the river in a manner that helps them, you know, become more successful with the big bug because the temptation is to throw it way out there in the middle and, you know, look at this small, this, this big mayfly that, or the stonefly yeah. that looks like a <laughs> broken down helicopter. Right. Uh, and it's, 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 it's very fun. It's a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, when it's, when it's on, it's, it's really a blast Yeah, so, because it's only a the year you can do it. So are you fishing <clears throat> typically, uh, with your clients, are you fishing both, uh, nymphs and dries and does that change throughout the day or the season? Oh, absolutely. Um, as cool as a stonefly hatch is, it can be very fickle and, and unpredictable and frustrating. So, I, I try to let people know that <clears throat> when when this hatch is going on, if if the fish are not you know looking up to these adults, um, and and to, obviously at the beginning of the, the the hatch cycle, most of the most of the food sources is through you know the via the nymph. So when these nymphs are crawling out, you definitely want to be fishing the stonefly nymphs in you know in, in a size. Um, eight or uh, a six and, and, you know, fairly weighted and get down in those seams and currents against the bank and brown, black, or, or, or gold. Uh, and there's a lot of different patterns out there, but I won't get into that because they're all basically imitate the same thing. Yeah. Um, and talk about, look, you know, 75% of the time fish feed on the subaquatic organisms anyway. So your chances of hooking fish are going to always be better if you're fishing the nymphs. Yep. Um, and then of course, as the hatch progresses and there's more bugs on the bank and they start, you know, all depositing their eggs and the fish become aware of that, then they start looking up uh, and start taking the adults. But um, I always advise if, <clears throat> if we're, you know, we are, this is the 20, what, third of, of May, you know, we're pretty much in the, into the meat of this hatch. And, um, and uh, so it's, it's always fun to okay, put on the dry cast it, you know, a dozen, two dozen times. And if you'll know within that period of mm. time, the, whether the fish are looking up or not. And if they're not, you've got to put your nymphs on and, and, you know, mm-hmm. go back and use a different technique. Mm. So, yeah. um, it's, it's always to your advantage to keep changing patterns to find out what the fish are keyed in on. 
Gotcha. No, that's a good tip. So basically, if you get to a spot, and a lot of the water, I guess you can fish dries or nymphs. So you, you cast a few with the dry, and if you don't get anything, then you switch over to a nymph. And, and, mm-hmm, and absolutely. Uh, and then, yeah. um, is there any yeah. tips that you have for, um, you know, one of the struggles I think with nipping, especially heavy weight, is breaking off flies. Is that just part of the game, or do you have any any tips on how to avoid losing your your big patterns when you're nipping? Well, yeah, I mean, you're you're going to lose some gear. You just you can't help it. Um, but one one thing that I've learned over the years is is to um, and and the patterns that I stock in the store, some are are you know heavily weighted, some are medium weighted, and some are light weighted. Um, and the reason I do that is because the closer to the bank you fish those flies as a nymph, um, you actually want to lighten hmm. those nymphs up a little bit because, one, the water and the current is going to be softer and slower. And obviously, two, if you have a huge heavy fly on and you throw it out there, well, it's, it's going to drift about three to four feet and get hung up on the bottom and yeah. you know, you're know you going to break your, break your rig off. So. Um, I've developed patterns over the years that are actually a little bit lighter. So when you're, when you're fishing heavy, deep, fast water, you definitely need the heavier flies to get the flies down, you know, to imitate their crawling behavior. Mm -hmm. But as you fish, as the hatch progresses, you're fishing a little bit closer and closer to the bank with these, with these artificial nymphs, you want to actually fish a lighter pattern. So it actually still drifts along near the bottom. And it looks like the natural, but doesn't get hung up, you know, every other cast. I mean, you know, you're going to get hung up every now and again, but, um, that, that is the, some of the techniques I use to, um, prevent losing a lot of gear. And actually, you know, it's a better fishing technique. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and how about the time of day? Does it matter whether you start early in the morning versus late at night versus, uh, you know, midday? Um, well, you know, this time of year, the, the law of bug activity takes place, you know, during the day. Um, however, most people don't know that these nymphs, when they're the most active, when they're crawling out, uh, typically crawl out at night. Hmm. So early in the day, you know, as the, as you know, we, as the morning starts to you know heat up a little bit, and the sun is getting higher in the sky. Uh, typically, you know, if you're out early, <clears throat> you don't have to be, but early in the morning, you might be catching the tail end of a particular migration cycle. Um, and obviously the nymphs would be the best to use at that time. If you're going to be fishing, you know, right at the crack of dawn. Mm-hmm. Um, but do these, do these nymphs crawl out throughout the day off and on? Yes, they do. Yeah. Um, do they crawl out in, in the density that they do it at night? Oh, not so much, but they st- still are active enough in the water to, 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 to fish them. As far as the evening goes, um, this time of year is not as active as, say, late June, July, August. Um, typically, springtime fishing on the Deschutes here um, is more of a, it's, it's throughout the day itself. Um, so you don't have to be out if you don't want to, you don't have to be out to crack it down and fish till, you know, the stars shine at night. Um, your, your, the, the stone flies will actually deposit their eggs typically in the latter half of the day from anywhere from, depending upon how warm it is from one o'clock till, you know, five, six o'clock in the afternoon, evening. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much the, the, the peak of their activity. Can you fish till dark with a big bug and, and, and get a few more fish? Sure. I mean, the fish still know what they are, but um, typically it's not those shoulder hours uh, that we deal with in uh, in July and August. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah. and as far as you mentioned, um, you know, a time to go. So if, if somebody was new to the hatch and you had to say, you know, <clears throat> You had to just say roughly, you know, the time is it is May 15th a good time to throw on your calendar if you're like, a, you know, eight months out and kind of planning a trip or, or should you should you wait till you get a little sure. closer? Yeah, no, I, it's in the last, I'd say, decade or so, um, the hatch has actually come off quite a bit earlier um, and it's sort of caught people off guard, but 
I would say, you know, historically, generally speaking, um, the time to be here to fish the, the, the salmon fly golden stone hatch is from approximately the middle of May to almost the middle of June. Okay. Um, that's, you know, if yeah. you're here, I mean, you could, you can block out on your calendar 10th of May through the 10th of June. Gotcha. And if you come over during that, you know, that four week period, you know, you're going to see stoneflies and, you mm-hmm. know, the chance of catching fish on a big bug is, is going to be fairly good. But okay. one tip I'd like to add is mm-hmm. don't get hung up on the big bug. You could have, I know folks that come over here and camp out for a week a week and a half and they only really experience, you know, one, two, or maybe three afternoons where the fish actually really went on the big bug in yep. a big way on top or as a nymph. So it, sometimes they don't key on it. There's other, mm-hmm. there's other bugs hatching mayflies and caddis that might be more abundant and more available to the fish. And, you know, so don't, don't yep. limit yourself to one pattern, you know, switch it up. For sure. Yeah. That's a, that's kind of a, that's a great tip too, because you can, you can even fish a dry fly with uh-huh. a, uh, a prince nymph dropper coming off of it or, you know, mixing things up that way where you're almost fishing two techniques. I'm not sure if that's the perfect way to do it, but I know you can catch fish that way. Sure you can. Yeah. You can fish a, a, a stone fly adult and, and drop off back, uh, with some, some a little slightly smaller tippet and, and even a smaller fly. And, uh, you got to remember that these trout feed on most of their diet is pretty small throughout yeah. the year. So mm-hmm. this is, this is the time of year where they get to feast on big stuff every now and again. But again, uh, the big tip is if it's not working, you know, uh, fish it with a smaller bug behind it or, you know, start fishing smaller patterns, all together, you know, a small caddis or a mayfly, and yep. even a dropper off of that. Yeah, so um, got to be versatile. Yeah, perfect, perfect. And uh, so I had a question about uh, kind of uh, thinking of a new guy coming to the river and never been there before. But before I get into that, I, I wanted to see if you maybe had a, you know, a story from your life or and or fishing. Um, that kind of had a big impact on where you are today and, and where you, you know, I mean, you've been doing this for over 30 years and I know a lot of people have come and gone. I, I wonder if there's a story that comes to mind that kind of, uh, I don't know whether a turning point or something that, that helped to kind of get you to where you are or something that's memorable. Um, I think, I think the, the main inspiration, at least for me was the, the first experience I had here. Um, my father and my grandfather, they, they loved to up on game hunt, um, birds and so forth. And typically, um, the first, uh, first day of September was always opening day of dove season. And so, you know, the big initial first hunting bird hunting trip of the year was, you know, jump on the, jump on the rambler and, and (laughs) throw the gear in the back and away to Madras we go. Uh, and it was an annual trip for them. And of course, growing up, I was, you know, pretty young and I think I was four or five and I was going, I go, I want to go. Cause they talk about it all the time. It sounded like fun. And my dad said, eh, not quite. So I think I was six. Yeah, I was six years old. And he said, okay, you can, you can come along, but you're just going to watch. I go, that's fine. I just want to go. So we load up and away we go early in the morning to, to Madras on, on that cold September morning and uh you know of course I'm wide awake and uh the area that is now the um Warm Springs boat launch is uh, is where my my grandfather he pulled over and stopped and I thought well why are we stopping here there's nothing there's nothing here so he opens the trunk and pulls out this steel telescoping uh fishing rod with a funky little Zebco looking <laughs> reel on it uh, and uh, a, a lure, which I think back in the day was called a wedding ring. Then he walked over to the bank and, you know, started casting this lure out in the deschutes, obviously, and started catching trout. <laughs> I was like, whoa, yeah. that's really cool. And, then, and I said, dad, can I go over there? And, and, and he says, yeah, go. So I got out of the car and ran over there and, and grandpa said, well, here, let me show you how to do this. So he, 
showed me how to operate the, the, the reel and the, and the rod and stuff and just here, you know, flick it out there, give it a cast. So I made, I don't know, a couple, three casts and, and hook a red side, <laughs> play it, land it, you know, 14, 13, 14 inch mm-hmm. trout. And I was like, holy moly, this is fun. <laughs> and so that was my, my introduction to, to fishing. And that was what really just got my juices going. And, uh, uh, but as far as, you know, the, the growth of, and, and, and my enthusiasm was when I, when I started fly fishing, because I thought, uh, this is so awesome because, you know, you can hook fish, play them, them and release them with relatively no harm to the fish. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that really got me going. Um, hmm. That was very inspirational to me because I thought, well, I can enjoy the sport and not have to worry about, you know, harming the, the fish. I mean, you know, if you're going to harvest something, harvest it. But mm-hmm. uh, making sure they go back safe is, was one of the things that I really thought was neat about fly fishing. But seeing the fish come up and take flies off the surface was, you know, the real, yeah. <laughs> the real joy. That's cool. You know, uh, so I think that initial trip was probably one of the biggest inspirations about, you know, just outdoors and getting out there and, and fishing and having fun. That's um, great. And I'm sure there's a bunch of other stories I can tell you, but yep. we don't have time yeah, for yeah. that. No, that's right. We got to you know? keep this, uh, keep this well. Well, maybe on the, uh, maybe on the next show, if we can get you back on here, we'll, we'll touch on more of that stuff. Um, but yeah, maybe we can bring it back sure. to that, that guy, you know, just picture that guy that, you know, he's been wanting to fish the river and the salmon fly never done it and, and heads over there and into mop and say that area. And, uh-huh. you know, there's well-worn trails everywhere, which probably means the fish have seen a lot of bugs as well. But, you know, for that new person, do you have any tips or something that would help them maybe get their first salmon fly, whether that's like time of day or fly to use or anything to, you know, maybe somebody that's heading over this weekend to help them out? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think first of all, um, making sure he's got the you know the right rod and reel. I think ideally, a uh, nine foot five weight rod is is going to do everything that they're going to need for fishing the drives and the nymphs. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's important because it's such a big bug. It it sometimes is is, is pretty air resistant. So it's it's definitely important to you know have the right sort of tapered leader to deal with these big bugs and i recommend fishing short leaders um short meaning a tapered leader that's uh, somewhere around 7 feet mm-hmm. um ending in a fairly fairly thick uh, x number so it's you mm-hmm. know aggressive enough to turn the big bug over so i'd say like a 7 Seven, seven and a half foot, uh, three X leader would be a, a good leader, overall leader to, to help, uh, deal with, you know, getting that leader to turn over and, and present the big bug. Mm-hmm. It also helps because you're going to be fishing against the bank and there's going to be, um, a lot of overhanging branches from the alder trees and, and that's where you need to be. Um, if you're out in open water, eh, you might catch a fish here and there, but yeah, you really got to get into areas where there's, there's good cover because those trout will tuck up underneath those trees and feel safe. They're in, you know, shade of the tree, there's a food source and, you know, the water is deep enough for them to feel secure. So mm-hmm. stay out of the open water. Um, the, the, the thing about the Deschutes is, is, you know, such a big river, there's just thousands of yards to fish. So, yeah, even on a crowded day, you know, if you, if you, if you're driving along the access road and you pull over to one of the turnouts, you know, rig up, um, get ready to go, make sure you got everything you need and, and just walk along the road. And, and if there's a little seam or an area where you can, you know, get down to the, to the bank safely, get down there, get in, get in, get in among the trees and, and, uh, keep your cast short and controlled and, uh, you, you'll do, You'll do very well uh, with with that approach. Um, a lot of people want lots of room, you know, and that's great, don't we all? But that's typically we're not a lot of fish. You've got to you've got to get in areas where the fish are going to be uh, along those tree lines, and and even a grassy bank. If the grass is tall enough, 
you know, it's going to droop over the river and, and make fish feel secure that way too. So you can fish a grass line and, and do pretty well also. It doesn't have to be in the trees, but just go to the areas that have obvious cover. Okay. So that's the, that's the biggest key is you got to yeah. fish under, under around trees and places where the, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. And you know, it's, it, it can be, you know, it can be challenging getting around, but all in all, if you take your time and just go slow, um, you can hopscotch around structures and boulders and stuff. And, has, mm-hmm. and it, it ends up being kind of fun because you're probably going to be by yourself. And, uh, you know, if there is another angler up the road or, you know, up the river from you, they're probably going to be, you know, hundreds of yards away. So mm-hmm. it's, it's probably, they're not going to disturb what you're going to be doing. So, um, yep. that would be my tip is okay. don't be afraid to just kind of take a little hike. Okay. And yeah. do you typically work your way fishing kind of upstream along the bank or do you ever go downstream? Um, more times than not, you want to be working upstream. Mm -hmm. So you're coming in from, you know, coming in behind the fish. Um, and there are those rare occasions where you can, uh, make a downstream cast and sort of draw the rod. As you make your forward cast, you draw the rod back. They call it a parachute or uh, parachute cast, uh, where you pull the, pull the fly rod tip back. So as the fly yep. lands in the river, as it's going away from you, you just feed the fly out like underneath the tree and mm-hmm. uh, by lowering the rod and, you know, feeding out a little bit of line and you can catch a trout doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but mostly if you can find yourself working your way upstream, um, that's probably the, the most, most successful uh, approach you can use. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. And I know you have um, a number of other resources out there. Um, and one of them, or a few of them, you've done some videos. And I, I know I've seen some stuff, some past videos with uh, with Rick Hayfley and things like that. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what you guys have done over the years and, and maybe uh, talk about how, because I know there is a little bit of a chunk of uh, humor in there, uh, including, uh, I think, the bug wand and some other things like that. Uh, maybe you explain, like, how you... You know, how you, uh, how you guys do your, your humor and then how many, um, how many videos and things like that you have out there? Um, yeah, of course. Um, uh, just a little, little bit of background. Rick, uh, I met Rick in 82. I took his entomology class. Um, and when I started, started over here in 85, I contacted him and said, Hey, uh, would you be interested in doing a entomology class? And, uh, he said, of course, yes. And so since then, so we've been doing these entomology classes every year for the past 33 years. And obviously we became friends and, um, talked about different projects and, um, thought about doing a book together, but we thought, well, it might be more fun if we, you know, made some DVDs. So fortunately we were on a a tight, uh, able to do this on a, on a fairly tight budget, but as we were as we were contemplating how we were going to approach it, it's like, okay, so how can we make this a little bit different than, you know, the typical, you know, text style? Um, this is an information video, and mm-hmm. uh, it's going to be, you know, you're going to have to work on staying awake and that sort of thing. So yep. we started, and we, you know, we both kind of climbed around a little bit anyway. Uh, and I thought, and we thought, well, let's let's add a little humor to this. Let's try to, first of all, try to keep the videos shorter than an hour uh-huh. and, and let's throw in some, 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 uh, something different that, that they're not doing out there. Let's, let's try to, you know, humor it up a little bit, you know? So let's come up with a character or something that's different. And yeah, so we, <laughs> he thought about the bug one, uh, over here and <laughs> we did a couple of test runs with it and, like okay, well that might work, and it might it might interest kids because there's so many kids out there that are missing opportunities and of you know how to have fun outside and go fishing and camping and so forth. So we thought that this bug one character would be you know would inspire some of the youth to to maybe go out and, and do some fishing, and so it's actually worked and uh, pretty <laughs> pretty hilarious. Even today, people will come in with their kids to shop and. And uh, the kid will ask, "Have you seen the bug one uh, lately?" You know, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it's sort of like, uh, it, you know, have you seen Santa Claus lately? <laughs> that's right. And, and the bug one is kind of a play on. Is it kind of a play on the like 
was it the Rajneeshi Rajneeshi kind of that yeah. thing back in the um whenever that was right. when they took over the town over in Oregon and um, yeah 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 yep. that's, so it's that's pretty interesting i mean i guess especially today in the you know the world of pol- politically correctness uh you know it's kind of funny but uh you know i think uh that, yeah. that that time was a pretty weird story how that whole thing went down anyways yeah that was a strange situation over there and and yeah. uh antelope um yeah, in antelope, but, exactly. um, how do you yeah how did, do you how do you, um, Go ahead. you know, if somebody wanted to find, um, some of these videos, are they all on DVD or DVD or can you find some of this on, on YouTube if somebody wanted to f- take a look at it? Um, well, the, currently we are working on getting them on, uh, uh Rick and, and Joe and, and uh, Scott are, are putting, putting together a situation where, uh, we can get them on, um, oh, what's the program? Oh, Vimeo. Vimeo. Yeah. So, that's what we decided to do. Gotcha. So we're so stream them, yeah. We're yeah. setting it out for that, but uh, there are still DVDs that you can purchase out there. Um, I have them in my store. the The first year, or the the first uh, uh, program was fishing. Well, the whole series is called Fishing Watch Western Rivers, and so the 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 first set we did has four volumes. So there's four DVDs on that, and then that was just general information. There was some bug collecting and how to identify bugs and fishing techniques and so forth. So it's pretty complete, and each, each DVD is a season, winter, spring, summer, and fall. Hmm. So that was our first effort. And then the uh, second uh, sequence was on uh, nymphing. We did one on, on basic nymphing, and then we did another one after that, a year later, on advanced nymph fishing techniques. And then after that, we did one on uh, advanced techniques for um, emergers and adults. So um, those, what, seven, seven DVDs we did um, are I have them in my store. You know, I can get them if people are, want to get a DVD. I can. We still have a source that I can get them from. So if they want to purchase them, they give me a call. I can mail them to them. Or if they're you know in town one day, want to pop in and grab a couple. That's you know I've got them here available. And I think uh, I'm not. I'm not certain exactly where they're available, and they might be available in other shops, but. We we shut down our our website because we're we wanted to do this Vimeo um, uh, program so give people the yeah, opportunity to just download it you know from the internet so mm-hmm. that's the direction we're going with it right now. Okay, okay, that makes sense. And I will leave yeah. a link. Um, uh, this show will be at uh, people can find it at wetfly uh, wetflyswing dot com slash john. I'll just have a, a link to this show that we're we're uh, doing here, and then I'll I'll provide some okay. links to um, you know your website or any of the other resources we chatted about here. And the entomology class sure. is that um, something? Do you still do that every year? Is that something somebody can can f- find? Yes, um, on my website there's an event page, and I we usually post uh, the spring classes that we hold. We did one in April and we just did one this last May 19th here last Saturday. Um, so those are classes that we do every spring. Uh, Rick is in pretty much a lot of demand for these classes. So he does them yeah. off and on throughout the summer through different various shops and, okay. and uh, regions of the West. So, yeah. but Rick and I typically always do two, try to do two or spring um, one, sometimes we do it as early as late March, but typically we try to do one in April and one in May. And those, those are always going to be posted. Um, I also, if on the front page of my website, there's a, if you want to sign up for my email newsletter, you can go on there and then, cause I'll, I'll post, yep. you know, upcoming events. Oh, perfect. And that's, that's part of it. So, perfect. But yeah, we do, we do those every year. Okay. And, yeah. They're a lot of fun. They're yeah, and I'll, and I'll provide a link to that in the show notes as well, where they can get on your email list. And yeah, Rick Hayfley, I just had a, uh, uh, you know, John, I, I know you got to get going here pretty quick. I had a couple more questions, and uh, 
real quick here sure. um, is uh, so Rick Hayfley is I hope to have him on the show here uh, soon in fact I think he we do have him scheduled to, to come on but um, I mean he is one of the biggest entomologists I mean that I know of is is that kind of in the western states that the thing I mean I don't know are there other entomologists out there is he one of the big names out there um honestly I'd have to say that you know if you want to know about insects in, in this side of the Mississippi um He's the guy. Yeah, that's what, that's what I, I thought. I don't yeah. know anyone. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Western hatches. And... I can't. Right. I, off the top of my head, I know there's uh, one or two entomologists that, that he's mentioned that are on the East Coast. But yeah, he, as far he, as the West, you know, he's, he's the guy. He's the guy. He's the man. That's pretty um, cool. That's... And he's really, uh, yeah, it's just amazing. His his not mm. just. <laughs> Yeah. Incredible. I know. Uh, yeah. I know. It's pretty awesome. No, that's cool. And yeah. on, on a kind of a, a side note, I know um, just more about the fly shop and the business thing. Um, you know, it's, I think you guys, and there's one other fly shop in Maupin and Maupin's a small town and, you know, I know it's a destination town, but how have you, uh-huh. you know, how have you kind of survived? You think of all the things over the years, a lot of businesses went out during the collapse in 2008 and stuff like that. I mean, how do you compete with the other fly shop and how have you been able to make it over 30 years in, in you know, a business that's not always easy? Um, well, w- one big thing that, that, that I've learned, um, even before I started a business, uh, for the fly shop is, is, is never allow my, I never allowed myself to overextend, um, financially. Uh, I always tried to live within my means. Um, I never tried to do things that were, you know, at a, at a higher risk. Um, and I think, uh, when, when my fly rod building business was growing, um, I never advertised. It was all word of mouth. And, um, my, my father always told me, he says, look, you're, you're only as good as your word. So Mm -hmm. if you say you're going to do something, do it. And if you can't, or if you don't think you can, don't say it. So, and that's, that's a rule you need to follow, you know, for yourself. And so basically it was like (laughs) pretty simple. I know it's it's kind of cliche ish, but the golden rule, you know, treat others like you want to be treated and, you know, be honest with them and, and give them a fair shake and, and tell them you can do something, that you can do and, and, but mm-hmm. don't tell them you, you can do something when you can't and, and shortchange them. Yep. So I always try to give people the, 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 the most, the best and the most accurate information. Um, I've always tried to give people the, the best customer service I could possibly provide for them. Mm-hmm. And if I couldn't help them, I would try to find someone else that could. Mm. So, uh, I never tried to be someone that I wasn't. And, uh, because of that, I was able to, you know, reach out and learn more about the business and, and, you know, not try to, not try to fake my way through it. Cause that would have been the death of, well, that's, that's the death of anybody that yeah. tries to do that. In business. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, it has not been a bed of roses. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, fly fishing is a luxury and it's, and it's a sliver industry. It's tiny Yeah, it is. and it's very, you know, it's very vulnerable. It's vulnerable to economy it's vulnerable to weather conditions um it's it's you know i mean Mm -hmm. if there's a recession people are gonna you know watch your p's and q's and stay home and make sure the mortgage and the rent's paid and they got food on the table you can't blame them so um uh the the and there's a lot of shops that have opened in the area over the last three decades no no kidding that you know initially you know there's there's an impact you bet but I just kept, you know, doing what I've been doing mm-hmm. and uh, help people the best of my ability. And so those folks were have been loyal to me, and, and I appreciate that because if it wasn't for them, you know, I wouldn't be here. Exactly. No, that's great. Uh, I just uh, – I'll let you get going here. So I just want to uh, see if um... – you know, maybe you can let us know in the next six months is if there's anything we can be looking for, uh, you know, you or what you're going to be up to. And then, um, and then also maybe let us know where we can, uh, folks can find you if they have questions. Okay. Yes. Um, well, the next six months, it's going to be, you know, pretty much full on <laughs> get over here and just enjoy yourself. Um, mm-hmm. I'd say, 
throughout the summer, you know, as the stonefly hatch uh, decays and, and, and goes away for another season, uh, that would be the time to really dig in and, and, and get your small bugs out and, and trust it. Um, uh, again, I mentioned earlier, these fish feed on small bugs throughout the year. It's something that they're used to and they're accustomed to it. So, um, I find that if you're not afraid to fish a 16, mm-hmm. 18, 20, or even a 22 mm-hmm. on this, on this huge river, um, you will be successful more so than the guy that's throwing the 12s and the 10s. Nice. Um, I, I haven't scheduled them yet, but I plan on doing, uh, one or two, uh, demo days where we'll have a selected rod company, uh, and we'll do this, uh, stream side on the shoots. And, and as we show the product, we will hmm. also be doing some casting instructions and, uh, technique, um, nice. illustrations and so forth to help people with their casting and mending and, and presentation, because let's face it, Getting the fly in the river is one thing, but making it look like the natural is another. So that's yep. one of the things we're going to do. Um, hmm. We are, you know, keeping our fingers crossed for at least a little better steelhead run. <laughs> uh, yep. But, um, you know, we're just going to stay hopeful on that. But the I would say August is a month that's going to be the most challenging for people. Um, mm-hmm. That's when you're going to be using a lot of small flies and you're going to be fishing those shoulder hours, you know, mornings yep. and evenings, midday is going to be Too pretty hot. dang tough. Yeah. So, Too yeah. Hot. Okay. Um, yeah. But, um, you can, uh, uh, the website, well, you, you can give them the website address. Yeah. yeah. But, what, what you can you uh, mention it here? Just, uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll also put a link in the show notes. So what, what, what the website uh, address is. Sure. Uh, the website is www flyfishingdeschutes.com okay perfect and they can just go there and uh, get on your email list or right. send you a message if they have questions sure and there's an email link uh, on that home page um, uh, which is info at flyfishing.com okay uh, and then my my email address is john j-o-h-n at flyfishingdeschutes.com so uh, relatively easy Great, great. And like I said, I'll have a wetflyswing.com slash John will be a link to um, all the show notes here. And uh, yeah, John, one to just say, okay. uh, you know, thank you for coming on and providing uh, the information here on the salmon fly hatch and a little bit of history on, you know, your business. It sounds like, you know, you've been around probably longer than most of them out there. So, um, you know, keep up uh, the good work and uh, sure. just wanted to say thanks for taking the time. Well, thanks for having me and, and uh, let's do it again. This was fun. Yeah, sounds good. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Okay, David. Okay, bye. Bye bye. I wanted to share a quick couple of clips from what I mentioned at the start of the show where a raft capsized and dumped four people into a large rapid on the chutes. And what is to follow is a little bit of a step by step through some of the highlights of us getting down there and helping them get to shore and then work on our way to flip the boat back over and uh, try to avoid losing gear. So here you go. Hope you enjoy. A boat just dumped. And I'm running to catch up with them and help. Get around a rock. Wrap it around this one right yep. There, yep. Wrap it around it. Go. Do your best. Do your best. You got it. It's not a great rock. I could slip. I could slip. Get it low. Can you get up to and pull into that? Well, I can in a second. I want to make sure you guys have it. I'm not sure I can pull that. I'm not sure I can pull that raft. You guys hit oh shit. No. I missed oh shit. It was the one on the left. Oh. Can't, that's can opener. Hazel. Jesus Christ. The boat's upside down. Green boat right here. I'm going to try to pull it out. I have no waders on. But I'm sure the thing's stuck. And you got more rapids. We got to get more help. There's more rapids, so we got to get it out here. 
anchor it up and let's get more help. One, two, Yeah, I guess we almost got on the bank, but now it goes out. I think that, that rapid split more boats in this river than any, anyone. <laughs> anyone. This is, my, this is my first raft. Really? Uh, my first rafting trip. No kidding. Well, it can happen to anybody, that's for sure. Are you okay, Kayla? I'm right, right Ready? Go. Go. There we got it. Keep going. Keep going. Push. Pull, 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 Eric. Keep going, you guys. We got it. Keep pulling. Keep going. There it is. Woo! Oh. Your legs, Dave. I got it. Right on the, right on the bags. Ah. Uh. Dude, it looks clean. That it looks clean. White horse. I mean, right at. Oh shit. Yeah. No, we were fishing. We were fishing. We were the. We saw him floating down. Shannon, who you'll you'll hear in this clip, has a key role in this fireside chat, and he's actually the person who coined the phrase "fireside chat with Dave" back on one of our trips uh, many years ago. So it's pretty uh, pretty perfect that uh, we're getting back to this now and having our first fireside chat. So. Uh, have a listen and uh, don't uh, don't take it too seriously. I'm gonna do a quick little fireside chat with Shannon, two minutes or less. Fireside. Fireside. This is the first. This is a lot of pressure. This is, it is. This is yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Coming. You guys are part of the crowd. So this is part of the the initial run of the fireside chat. And I'm gonna sit down. We're fireside. And I'm going to ask you, Shannon, a couple of questions, and these are going to be relevant to the trip we're on and all that. But So my first question is, or it's more of a comment, tell me about pigs. Pigs? Wow. I mean, they are wonderful lovers. <laughs> tell me about your experience what, as a... What, as, as what, a, what the <laughs> fuck? Why am I asking? That, this, is, your, this is my question to you. <laughs> My question to you is, what happens if you fall down in a pig pen? Oh, man. Exactly. That's what I was, Your dad that, that walks was away question. and says, don't fall down, they'll eat you. And uh, that's that's where you're left in Iowa. Yep. It's, it's kind of... Yeah. Is that really true, though? <laughs> I'm not sure. I mean, I think it is. Like, the pigs... I mean, was your dad telling you the truth, you think? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think he was telling me the truth. Yeah, they'll eat you. Pigs, yep. pigs will eat you, that's... Hey, it, well, here's the, here's take, a more relevant question. Take that question. home, kids. Here's the more take, relevant question. Here's this is this is fireside chat. I'm getting literally getting blown away by the fire. Oh man! As I chat, it's and I will say here. that uh, my one question I do want to ask you is: tell me how you first got into fly fishing. Oh man! Just a quick little rundown, like a, oh, maybe I a first got into fly fishing. Uh, a thirty second <laughs> minute or less. Sure. Yeah, I was working and uh, doing biological stream surveys and my boss at the time was a big fly fisherman and he's so big today and I, I remember that first night that he took me out and yep. uh, showed me how to fly fish and it was unproductive and frustrating but man I had a good time yep that's and that's uh, hashtag Rick Hayfley yep Rick Hayfley <laughs> Wow, that's I'm, pretty good. I'm crying from the smoke here. <laughs> Jeez, Russ, kill both. Russ, uh, you uh, you were saying? Well, I was going to interject a thought. Yeah. Uh, I knew this guy by the name of uh, Alan. Alan. Yeah, Alan. And he he basically taught me to fly fish. Really? Yeah. Alan. And uh, yeah, he looked a lot looks a lot like you, Dave. Actually. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. He looks a fair bit like you. Actually, kind of talks like you. Huh? Incidentally, but and we were on the Deschutes, my very first fly fishing experience ever. And we were on the Deschutes, and it was during the salmon fly hatch. No way. Yep. 
he says was no Greg way. there? He says no way. Was, was <laughs> Greg there? <I> just, <laughs> anyway, uh, it, and um, and so he was like showing me how it's done, and so he had this like uh, stonefly imitation on, and he yeah. was casting, and this big trout was just slurping under this tree, and it, everything the guy threw at it, nothing. And he got so pissed off that he just grabbed a stonefly off of the grass and stuck it on his hook. Yeah. It was all fluttering around. Yeah. And he chucked it out there under the tree. Yeah. Blammo. Isn't that an amazing story? Blammo. And folks, that poacher, that, that poacher, Alan, Alan. is yours truly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, w- I will. I, I will admit it. I will. Admit it. I remember very well. Greg Lundy was there. It was, God, you know the funny thing. You were the, so pissed. The great thing about so talking about this stuff is that, for me, I just think of you as like fly fishing your whole life. I don't even think. I don't even remember that. Like that's the first time ever. Yeah. That's crazy because it seems like when I my memory of that is like you are already a full on like just fly fishing. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't have a memory of you as a beginner. Which isn't that crazy? Well, I mean, I watched him today, so yeah, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> he's, he's, he looks terrible out there. So your your first fly fishing was on this trip with Russ and Shannon. Yeah, the first wow. real fly. That's amazing. Really? Look at that. I never would have guessed that. So that's what I'm saying. That same thing is. And the cool thing is, we're all in a totally our, you know, kind of in our own thing, right? You kind of in your own world, doing your own thing and yeah. learning. And, <laughs> Jeez, I know. Hey, no, it's too smoky. Oh, wow, it is smoky. The fireside chat, we're getting smoked out. This is unbelievable. What else you got, Dave? I don't know. I, I really was kind of coming uh, unprepared to this and hoping that you'd break, break out the magic stick. <laughs> Maybe we should go back to Shannon and his pigs. That's what I thought. Hey, I thought the more, pig. More I thought leading with the pigs would be good. Yeah, pigs are good. You know, I came into this all foamy all the time, but uh, stimulator's back. Really? It's yeah, back, baby. Look at this. Yeah, the stimulator. Did you get that fish? That monster sixteen inches. The monster fish the... was from the stimulator pattern I found in the tree, retrieving yep. the fly that yep. I lost Total. earlier. And that stimulator had rubber legs. Rubber legs, and it was very orange. Yep. Very orange. Yep. yep. All right. Stimulator. I'm going to leave it off at the... I want to go stimulator, and I probably should to double up the stimulator. But to be different, I'm going to say Prince Did you Nip. say you want to double up the stimulator? <laughs> I'd say Prince Nip. No, Prince no, Nip. I, that's not how I'm interpreting it. Yeah. <laughs> That's the end of the story. That's the great thing about being the host. You can fish it off and complete it the way you want, and we'll leave Shannon's. So I'll make sure to cut that part of it out. Thanks for coming by Fireside Chat. This has been a good night with uh, Shannon, uh, Shannon, Russ, and Tim. You guys, anything, any parting words as we leave Fireside Chat tonight? Parting words, anybody? I really love the ending of that Fireside Chat episode with, with Shannon. And the guys, I laugh every time I hear that. I hope you do. Uh, I hope you did too. And I want to uh, thank you for all the support uh, you've given me and the show throughout the first season. It, it means the world to me, and I, I want to thank you for that. I've heard from so many uh, people out there from around the world, um, literally from around the world, that they listen to the show and appreciate um, everything we're putting together here. So... Um, season one is, is over. We're going into season two and I, I plan on season two being just as good as the first one. And we're just going to keep moving ahead. So again, thanks for all your support and hope to, uh, talk to you soon. I'm going to try to slow him down. Oh, he's going. Jesus. It's a nice fish. It's like a steelhead. I'm just slowing him down with my reel now. Holy cow, how big is that fish? He's down almost into my backing. He's almost in some wood. Let's try and get him above. Nice. Get him above here. Yeah, he took that. He took that right on the surface. Stimulator. I can't even get him. I'm gonna, and I don't want to crash through this water because 
It's snaky country, but I got them hooked good. That's it, man. Do this one. Really cool.